Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to uh, yeah, happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Sci-Fi. Uh, really happy to be joined by um, Alex Tet Guang Lee today um, from uh, Kyung Hee University in South Korea. Um, Alex is a, a writer, Marxist, and and in psychoanalytic writer, uh, exploring popular culture, politics, and especially the, the question of capitalism in Asia. Uh, so hopefully we're going to get into these topics of what East Asian and Asian capitalism m- might be and how to, to kind of relate to that psychoanalytically and from the perspective of an international left as well. Um, but um, yeah, so, but, uh, and Alex also, uh, I should mention, uh, has a great article in Sublation magazine, which um, has uh, has been, in fact, Alex, it was uh, uh, the second most successful, only Slavoj Zizek's article uh, did better than yours. So. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a good, strong representation of the uh, psychoanalytic international left there. Mm. So, uh, and that's called, say, Hegel and Netflix, uh, which we're going to talk about along with um, some of Alex's other work. So, Thanks for joining us, Alex, and uh, yeah, lovely to see you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so, I mean, let's. Like, I'd like to just ask first, like, what's what's your sort of career been, your career trajectory? Like, I mean, right now you're, uh, you know, you've done, you're uh, very much a Marxist, also in some sense a communist. You did this communism book with Zizek, didn't you? Edited this communism mm-hmm. book, is it called Communism 101 or something like that? Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, if I introduce myself, uh, you know, shortly, and then actually I'm a, very inclined to, you know, communism, you know, rather than uh, socialism or some other, you know, um, terms which indicate the kind of uh, the way to overcome the capitalism. But, uh, you, know, you know, that actually the, the, the sense of communism a little bit old fashioned these days, but in my opinion, communism will be only solution to uh, capitalism. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean actually the end of capitalism where some, in, if you prepare, you know, the Hegelian, you know, the term might be a sublim- sublimation of that kind of, you know, the capitalist mode of, you know, production. And then now that I'm quite interested in that, how the mode of, you know, production, that means in a capitalist mode of production could be, you know, to bring in its own paradox and then uh, or some kind of a delirium of, you know, capitalism would bring up, you know, the new actual mode of production or something like that. And then also related to the, our way of life, the change of the, the which actually the, um, changed, you know, the, our thinking. And then that's why I'm quite interested in the psychoanalysis because the psychoanalysis, in my opinion, the only actually the, the only theory which talk about, you know, the, the, the radical subjectivity against, you know, the Kantian, you know, the conceptualization of a subject. It means that we are still uh, stuck to that kind of uh, idealism to some point. Liberalism, you know, it's lots of uh, neoliberal, you know, the ideology, which actually, you know, encouraged us to uh, build up, you know, perfect self. And then, uh, you know, self actually related to some kind of uh, freedom. And then uh, we have this abstract idea, but uh, we didn't have any, you know, answer to how to actually bring in this kind of freedom, you know, something like that. So what does freedom mean, you know, these days? Lots of uh, actually advisors, you know, you can see that even, you know, YouTube, a lot of people talk about freedom. You should actually earn money and then money will give you mm. freedom or this kind of property or some wealth, you know, t- um, it's kind of bourgeois ideology would give you kind of like a freedom, something like that. It's a, that is a dominant discourse, but psychoanalysis is to some point this, the construction of this kind of bourgeois ideology. And then I think that's why just I quite uh, interested in psychoanalysis in terms of uh, uh, what you know, Marx you know, tried to say is uh, yes. against the Robinson Nate or something like that. So I'm doing uh, these days, you know, bringing together, you know, that kind of political aspect of uh, psychoanalysis and the Marxism in this sense. I think that's a, a really interesting point and a, and a good answer that, like, you, in a sense, psychoanalysis can be part of a kind of mm-hmm. potential of an, a not capitalist subjectivity mm-hmm. in, a, in a certain way. But um, I just want to go back to what you said about at the beginning when you said that you, um, you know, lean towards a term like communism as opposed to a term like socialism. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, talking of the kind of international left, I mean, I think that's an interesting point because mm-hmm. we have, we one could argue that you've that there's been a rise of socialism over the past, say, five, six mm-hmm. years. You know, examples like um, Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn, Melanchon. Mm-hmm. 
But communism, something different is at stake with this term, I think. Um, and, and obviously that's got its Asian history as well, which you know about. But exactly. you know, to, to put the question in a simple way, what do you think is, is at stake in this difference between communism and socialism? And, and why is it that communism is a term you would want to, to sort of defend yeah. or, or, or go for? Good question. Good question. Yeah, actually, Karl Marx already defined you know, what communism means, you know, is a specter, you know. Spectre is not. It's, it doesn't. It does exist. You know, as a spectre, it's not. Uh, you know, ghost. It's not uh, the revenant. It's a sort of a spectre. That means uh, visible. It's a visible. Communism is a visible. Even today, you know, you can see that communism hovering around in you know, capitalism. You know, actually, already a uh, uh, celeb Zizek already you know, pointed out when the you know the pandemic began. And for instance, you know, lots of state. You know started to uh, to do you know that kind of uh, the policy you know the against the, the capitalist you know mode of production you know they're using uh, their you know the um the finance you know power to support you know the people today even you know you can see the lots of inflation and the lots of you know economic financial crisis but state you know try to control this one in a kind of communist way but uh, I want to actually go further because, you know, the communism does not mean actually the, you know, kind of uh, economic system. That's what I'm thinking, you know, these days. And then uh, if you say actually the difference between uh, communism and socialism, of course, actually, socialism will be the in economic stage to go further to uh, communism, something like that. But in my opinion, the, what is communism? Communism is merely imagination of the future or some creation of the future. That is... Uh, the entirely, you know, the belong to your subjectivity. So uh, what we need at the moment is communist subjectivity, which means, you know, they're actually the, um, reflecting on, the, you know, that kind of capitalism where some try to uh, bring in a future, you know, against this kind of present. That means that the present is a sort of a reiteration of the past. What we live actually you know, in terms of a present is definitely from the past. But uh, how can we change the present? Only way, the only way we can do is uh, bring in the future. How can we do that? That is exactly, in my opinion, the, we can find out uh, some answer in psychoanalysis. Is uh, Psychoanalysis taught us what? You must have new subjectivity. And what is this new subjectivity? Of course, subjectivity belongs to the future. And then in, in Nietzschean sense might be, you know, untimely subjectivity. If you got that kind of communist idea, it might be a madman or something like pathological, you know, subjectivity. So this is, in my opinion, the affirmation, you know, done by a psychoanalysis, you know, mm -hmm. even Louis Althusser already, you know, discovered this one. Mm -hmm. What is psychoanalysis? How can we bring together, you know, psychoanalysis and Marxism? I think we can answer to that. Communist subjectivity is our goal, you know, that, that is a, Actually, the you know my answer to that. So that I mean, that's it's, that's great. It's an extremely important point. I think is is it? Am I right in thinking? Is it right that we could perhaps say then that the term socialism, as it kind of exists in society today, it's it exists kind of within the limits of what we kind of currently mm -hmm. understand, mm -hmm. and therefore it has a kind of inherent or essential tie to the kind of capitalist system we live in. Mm -hmm. Whereas this kind of psychoanalytic view of communism and this idea of communism as a spectre. Mm -hmm it's the kind of possible outside or possible other way of exactly. structuring and, and thinking mm -hmm. that, that isn't sort of rational, doesn't necessarily make rational sense within the structure we're in. Is, is that the point you're, you're making? Yeah, exactly. Actually, it seems actually irrational, but, uh, you know, the, you know, actually, that's why actually I'm still uh, very um, interested in the, you know, the Lusian Gattaris and Antidipus and the Thousand Bilato. I think, uh, in my opinion, the, it, those, you know, the works, um, you know, the, the push forward, you know, this kind of psychoanalytic discovery, you know, further, you know, to uh, that kind of actually the combination between uh, Marxism and psychoanalysis beyond the Hegelianism, in my opinion. So Hegelian idealism, you know. So, um, the, you know, the, at first time, if you, uh, you know, the talk about the future, is a, it means that if you talk about communism at the moment, lots of people would ridicule you even in Korea and then uh, in Asian countries, if you talk about, yeah, because yeah. we already had this failure, you yeah. know, communi the, the communist movement failed in these areas. And then anti-communist, you know, the 
strategy was quite successful, prevailed, you know, the whole history. But, you know, the, this failure means, you know, some kind of uh, the possibility, you know, you know yeah. gain. What I mean, actually, the, uh, the capitalism does not also actually, you know, bring in, you know, the, actually that kind of successful uh, achievement, you know. Even though actually we believe that this civilization is, uh, you know, shaped by capitalism and then in, in my country, actually, you know, the um, lots of people still believe that you know, capitalism is identi identical with, you know, this kind of civilization or you know, something like that. But uh, that is ideology. But this ideology always, uh, you know, the preserve that kind of paradox, you know, from the within. That's what I'm saying, you know. And then uh, always actually there is kind of uh, the, the void, you know, the ideology always have void, you know. If you try to uh, realize the ideology uh, from top to the bottom, that you know the form of the formal logic of the kind ideological you know the the excursion would you know the reveal that kind of a paradox, and then the paradox is always as you said is uh, the moment we can uh, find uh, you know some kind of outside of this regime you know mm. the outside but it's not does not exist outside of the regime of course that exists within this regime but that is better in my opinion so. Um, you know, actually, this failed. Everybody knows, you know, the communism failed and everybody knows, you know, the revolution failed. <laughs> but, uh, you yeah. know, and even though we know that communism will be a solution to capitalism, but thing is that we don't actually, the, you know, the, take this actual solution, you know? Yeah. We don't, no, we don't think... actually, the, you know, the take in this kind of reality. Yeah, no, no, I, I think it's really interesting in terms of what we were saying. I mean, because... What what we see here, I'm sure it's the same, and, and we'll get now on to thinking about the question of Asia, but and I would say anti-communism um, mm. has recently been kind of on the rise in the UK. And, and you know, we saw it, um, a kind of anti-communist rhetoric around COVID, you know, with uh, some people saying, look at these regulations, mm. they are basically this dystopian communist state control. We saw it with attempts to turn Jeremy Corbyn into this kind of a communist, uh, evil communist figure to be fearful of. So it's super interesting that on the one hand, you've got what some people see as a rise of socialism, but a, mm. a running alongside that, there seems to be an increase in anti-communism. Mm. And what mm. effect this has on like global politics, I think is really interesting. And your, your point kind of... Um, really kind of speaks to that but but I guess what I want to ask you about next is uh, I mean when we were just offline you you started to talk about the history of psychoanalysis and 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 the history of communism in uh, the context of South Asia so you mentioned that Lenin kind of disavowed Freud or whatever so you know let, let's talk a bit about the your own context and you, you write in in the, your squid game interpretation about the, the the relationship between North Korea and South Korea right and you make this really interesting argument that um well it's fascinating you you talk about how the north korean propaganda channel um used squid yeah. squid game right almost to legitimize their own uh, state communism because it was like look at this disgusting capitalism that happens in south korea and so on so i mean we could talk about squid game definitely but also what what's the history first of, of this kind of relationship between um korea communism and, and psychoanalysis as well yeah, actually, we had a, a very, you know, the strong, uh, you know, the communist movement, you know, the since the 1920s. And then uh, the Korean Communist Party, of course, it wasn't actually you know, approved by uh, you know, the commentary in those days. But uh, anyway, just uh, uh, historically, uh, you know, it established earlier than the Chinese Communist Party, you know, is a... Uh, of course, in those days, uh, we already had, you know, the Japanese Communist Party, but the Japanese Communist Party is a little bit different, you know, from the, you know, all those uh, Communist Party in Asia, which was, you know, controlled by Comintern or some, uh, you know. Um, but actually, the, you know, the Korean Communist Party uh, quite, you know, the uh, uh, strongly, uh, you know, the uh, devote themselves to uh, Comintern. What I mean, actually, the the Soviet Russia in those days. It's Lenin and Stalin you know, after, afterward. And then, uh, you know, the different from uh, Chinese, you know, Communist Party, you know, the led by uh, Mao Zedong. Um, the Korean Communist Party was led by uh, Park Geun-hye, Mr. Park. And then, uh, but, you know, the different from the, you know, actually the Mao Zedong's, you know, the route as the Korean uh, Communist Party followed 
you know, the, the Stalin's, you know, direction with the fidelity. So that was actually, the, in my opinion, the problem of uh, the Korean Communist Party because, you know, the Stalin ordered, you know, Korean Communist Party uh, changed their title to uh, the Workers' Party because oh. he believed that the stage of a revolution in Korean Peninsula uh, should be um, kind of bourgeois revolution. That's why they, uh, the Stalin you know, thought. In my opinion, in this sense, Stalin is a pure socialist. Stalin was not a you know, communist. In my opinion. Right. He yeah. was a socialist. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to blame him. I think uh, he's actually, you know, the failure or his error might prove what I want to argue in terms of communism. So mm -hmm. he uh, thought, you know, the communism come, um, you know, the actually, you know, according to development, you know, he, in my opinion, he. He was he he was inclined too much to a development theory, and then uh, he thought you know communism is a consequence of the kind of economic development or something like that, and then or some dialectical, you know the sub sublimation or something like that. So um, this is exactly you know the the reason why the North Korea has you know the working with the Workers Party, not the Communist Party. But China still has a China Communist Party, and Japan also has, you know, the Communist Party. But uh, Korea, uh, kind of uh, the good, you know, fella to Stalin, changed their title, and then the uh, Korean Communist Party changed their title to Workers' Party, and then now we see the Workers' Party in North Korea. And then uh, that's why just we can say that, you know, that North Korea will be the remnant of the kind of socialist Stalinism, you know, mm. and then variation of their kind of Stalinism. And then uh, that's why actually the, if you check out there, um, they what they try to do is definitely to remove the, the kind of individual self. And then I don't think actually they had, you know, the, um, the psychoanalysis there. I think that right. North Korea might be the only country which has no psychoanalysis at the moment. Right, right. I mean, let's let's talk about that. You you were just saying that you know we were just talking about before Brazil, and you've just come back from Mexico, and talking yeah. about like the status of psychoanalysis globally. So you know, do, are, is it is it prominent in South Korea, or it's still fairly quite quite yeah. niche? Uh, what, what's the status we, of it? We have a now actually flourish of a psychoanalytic practice, you know, mm -hmm. in in you know public sphere, not you know academic, you know. System and the that means that actually the um, mostly in academic field um, the the ego psychology quite dominant, mm -hmm. influenced by American psychology, you know, as like a, exactly what you know Lacan criticized, so uh, positivistic and then very empirical, you know, the actually the psychotherapist, you know, the the, the psychotherapeutic, uh, psychotherapeutic, you know, the practice dominant in Korea. Mm -hmm. And the psychoanalysis is a, a part of, you know, actually this, you know, the psychological uh, practice. And then, uh, uh, no, you know, the, as far as I know, you know, the, no university system you know, teaching psychoanalysis at the moment in Korea. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, in public sphere, very flourish and mm -hmm. prevailed over the you know, other people. I mean, and is it, would you say it's associated with a, a leftist movement or, or, or is, this part, is it part of this kind of socialism that you think isn't going far enough? And the, the reason I ask is last week, um, the last guest was uh, uh, Christian Duncker from Sao Paulo, and he was talking mm -hmm. about how in Brazil this, this kind of, um, you know, there is this possibility of psychoanalysis really being part of this kind of anti-Bolsonaro movement. Obviously, the context is really mm -hmm. different to... Uh, yours, but I just wonder whether in South Korea this flourishing practice of psychoanalysis is it political? Does it kind of avoid politics? Or I don't know. Do you see this as like a uh, a real um, opportunity for your own sort of political ideas, or or something quite disconnected? Often, I think I might be the only you know the <laughs> academic who uh, <laughs> regard you know actually psychoanalysis as kind of leftist you know uh, the strategy or leftist theory. Mostly, most of the psychoanalytic practice in Korea, unfortunately, quite you know the clinical inclination. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it, it it has you know the clinical sense. So, uh, um, in the you know, broadcasting and then you know the, some sort of popular culture, they adopted a lot of psychoanalysis, but it doesn't mean you know that kind of political sense. And then, but quite another you know very funny uh, interesting thing is that. Um, 
most of people are quite hostile to psychoanalysis, but uh, you know they quite friendly to Slavoj Zizek. Uh -huh. So in Korea, psychoanalytic uh, discourse means you know the Zizek's you know philosophy. So Slavoj Zizek is a quite a head figure in Korea, you know, the, which uh, oh. you know they bring in that kind of you know political sense of you know psychoanalysis. So not much a clinical sense. So that is exactly outstanding, you know, feature of Korean psychoanalytic, you know, the practice is uh, the in in it, the mainstream of psychoanalysis was is a psychology is mostly uh, inclined to clinical, you know, sense. But uh, you know, Zizek's, you know, the uh, the Korean reception of Zizek is uh, actually try to change, was intervene the, this kind of uh, the mainstream, you know, practice Ooh. of psychoanalysis. It's interesting, and I suppose he did have that impact in Europe some years ago as well, um, but I guess not so uniquely. I mean, that's interesting. Um, I mean, he was, he was also quite surprised when I invited him. You know, firstly, uh, it was actually twice. You know, the the for him to you know the visit Korea, but then when I organized his public lecture, you know, in in my university, and then. Uh, audience number of audience were was you know almost uh, 3000 you know yeah yeah, yeah. no it's, it's... all actually the audience appeal up to you know that you know wow. the auditorium <laughs> and she was surprised <laughs> <laughs> It's really interesting. I mean, let's. Let, I mean, you use a kind of Zizekian argument and a Lacanian one to, to talk about the question of capitalism in Korea through uh, Squid Game. You know, I'm sure uh, most of our listeners want to know what you think of Squid Game anyway. Um, but I mean, I, f I find the article really interesting. And you also kind of um, oppose or counter the interpretation of um, Byun Chul Han, um, uh, who kind of um, sees it as an embodiment of capitalism. So, you know, just just take us through this. Like, uh, did you like Squid Game? And then tell us like how it was received in Korea and in North Korea as well. I, li I like Squid Game, but the uh, thing is that you know the, there are many issues hidden, you know, in the within that kind of popularity. In my opinion, okay, just uh, focusing on the, that kind of formal logic, as I already actually discussed in my article, the Squid Game nothing to do with, in my opinion, Marxist in the perspective to you know the or Marxist critique of capitalism. So because actually in mostly uh, the uh, in my opinion the insisting on uh, that kind of an actually the utilitarian you know the value it means uh, justice you talk about justice and then uh, uh, just the rule of the game, you know, but that is exactly uh, in my opinion the. The reason why the actually you know the I just uh, thought the Squid Game is a more utilitarian you know drama rather than you know the Marxist you know the critique of capitalism, and they put, actually we accept that fact you know this uh, drama is about you know the utilitarian value. It might be uh, actually reiteration of the Robinson story, the that actually the Karl Marx you know already criticized in his you know the in his you know the work Capital, so. Uh, the Robinson Nader was story of Robinson is in a bourgeois story. That means uh, actually individual success story. You know, it's about that. And then, uh, uh, in my opinion, Squid Game would you know the express you know that sort of uh, anger. You know, so people's anger you know the against capitalism, which does not you know give them uh, or allow them uh, you know the just you know the opportunity something like that. So of course that that kind of argument, mm -hmm. that kind of anger, very important. But thing is that um, this is, is one you know point I try to make. Another one is uh, you know, Pyong uh, Han and then you know, even North Korea, you know North Korean propagate you know uh, propagation uh, argued that you know uh, Squid Game reflected actually the the reality of capitalism, where some uh, you know the it showed that kind of uh, the miserable you know the the reality of South Korea. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. Is it that kind of idea or that kind of, you know, the interpretation, in my opinion, the, you know, the, um, the, how can I say, just, a, you know, the, um, the you know, kind of reflection theory, you know, that is uh, the code words, you know, the actually, you know, the quite uh, clumsy, vulgar, you know, version of a realism, some sort of that. Actually, they believe that, you know, the, the, the the cultural form or some aesthetic you know the um the you know the the realization would reflect the social reality 
that is actually 19th century realism or something like that. So I don't agree with that. You know, actually the squid game is more symbolic, you know, poem. And then uh, this symbolic poem would, you know, the, tell us something different. That means that like, from that what we actually directly seen at the moment. That means the symbolic poem always uh, tell us the, you know, the how desire, you know, works out. It's yeah, just, right, it's right. about uh, desire, not the kind of, you know, the reflection of a social reality. But yeah. mental health uh, analysis or North Korea propagation, uh, you know, do not actually, you know, the focused on this kind of uh, symbolic meaning of the form. Mm. That's my point. Second I think it's point. a good reading. And I think that, um, I mean, I just ask something about interpassivity as well. But uh, I think it's important that, you know, it, it is true, actually, not just Byung Chul Han, but in general, people's instinct was to say, well, yeah, this is an allegory. This is a, a kind of realism, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and actually, your argument is is that, well, it's really more of a psychoanalytic yeah. idea of desire, right? That um, yeah. desire is, it needs to be, you know, kept the, the ball has to be kept up in the air, as it were, like, uh you you kind of um it's not you know this is was your is your conclusion you um you you don't simply uh you, there's this kind of um uh suspension of desire going on it's a, it's a commentary on how desire functions right within uh, this particular capitalist society right rather than uh, so I, I agree with that and you you use this term um, which comes from robert farla and this is yeah. one um, i was i was really happy to see in your in your um manuscript because i think this term is is really useful and, and kind of underused right so people right. some of our listeners probably haven't heard it before um and it's it's a the, the term is interpassivity um mm -hmm. and it's a you know a term coined by robert farler who's kind of freudian rather than lacanian um uh, mm -hmm. um psychoanalyst in vienna so um i mean t tell us what interpassivity is alex and why you think it's a useful term mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. in kind of context yeah actually the good question in such a manner you know i would you know follow you know GJX, you know what I mean GJX analysis of uh, the desire. But I mean actually the in my opinion the you know the the all kind of uh, you know popular culture is kind of cultural industry you know in the you know I don't know sense you know what I mean the what is the this kind of the cultural industry you know it's not like uh, you know the production of culture it's kind of uh, the uh, machinic enslavement in delusion gatari sense, you know, in machinic enslavement of our desire. Mm -hmm. It aims at that is a cultural industry. Is like that's why I just I don't know criticize, you know, or so identify the cultural industry with the you know administration society. It's a control society. It, that, that means K-pop or some kind of American, you know, pop culture, all kind of this actually the culture aims at, you know, the aims at definitely in my opinion, the you know the controlled our desire, so that means actually the, it, and then it doesn't mean actually the, like you know Orwellian sense you know Big Brother you know control us. It doesn't mean that we actually voluntarily you know um, the the endowed our desire or some our you know the pleasure to something you know actually outside of ourselves. What is that? That might be called. Uh, in I don't know sense might be you know administration society or some management or sort of that or even you know the state you know the nation state and whereas in my opinion the cultural industry is a kind of such a system you know which actually they not uh, allow us to endow the, our you know to yield our desire to them. These days we can see that kind of platform capitalism you know this sort of technology definitely technology look like you know the. Um, something, uh, you know, the convenient to our life, but definitely there's always, you know, the this kind of technology uh, preserves some stupidity. Technology is stupid. What I mean, if you try to Google your name on the, you know, the internet, you can find out the information about you, but uh, all, all of actually that information, you know, would not be actually the kind of exact one you actually expect to see. You cannot account on that, those, you know, the information. And then, and then actually you can find out the Google's message, you know, on your actual profile. Why is that? If you find out some error or wrong information, please contact me. <laughs> <laughs> or some, uh, please give us, you know, that kind of information about you. That is the technology. That is exactly, in my opinion, the, you know, meaning of the administration society, meaning of the cultural industry. That means the fandom is definitely 
the pendulum is sort of you know the the machine enslavement to our desire, and this is a pendulum. The way the the the, the way in which the pendulum you know the the use our tech pleasure principle is definitely rely on this kind of interpassivity. So mm. this is in my opinion. Interpassivity is quite simple actually. According to Paula, um, you know the if you have uh, some sort of uh, um, you know the pleasure principle. For instance, actually, the what the, you know the Paula uh, picked up, you know, for uh, explaining the concept uh, was that uh, you are you know professor and that you uh, the, would you know go to a library, and then you don't actually you know read you know the books and they simply copy of that. And these days, actually, you would you know search uh, some kind of uh, you know the article on internet. And download mm. it, lots of a PDF from sort of that, and uh, you don't read it. And then, but actually, you uh, download it and the save yeah. with those, yeah. you know, the PDF <laughs> on your actually, you know, the 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 file, you know, the sector. And then uh, you actually relieved. Oh, I just uh, do a research or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. The computer reads <laughs> it for <laughs> me. <laughs> that is exactly you actually endowed your uh, you know purpose or your intention, your desire to machine. And mm. then you will be relieved by doing that. But you don't yeah. know how that kind of action, you know, can be connected to when you try to do. But technology would give you that kind of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, compensation, you know. That's what I'm, I'm thinking. So uh, interpassivity in these days became a very um, the important, you know, concept. If you understand how this sort of, you know, technological or some algorithmic, you know, um, the control, you know, the yeah, uh, change your life. I mean, I totally agree with that. And in a way, this this leads us back to um, the question of psychoanalysis, because in your um, article, Hegel and Netflix, um, mm. which I'll just I'll put this link in the in just underneath here for people to click on. You you basically argue, as you've just been saying, that we look what we're looking at here is a um, mechanical modification of desire, right? Mm. So, in other words, like algorithm programs, curation tools, uh, things like Netflix is obviously a, a, an example. But as you say, it, it, this is we're using these programs all of the time. Um, you know, you read this through Hegel, but you essentially argue that ultimately there's a sort of transformation in desire happening here. Like the, the, the modern subject, the desiring subject of, of the age of algorithms is kind of different to the one from before. Interpassivity, I suppose, is one way of sort of thinking about uh, how this, this world of um, digital this curation world functions when it comes to desire, but so, uh, but in a broader sense, um, it, what's your position here? And, and is it is are you saying, uh, in a certain sense, you're saying that psychoanalysis, uh, along in this case with Deleuze and Guattari's ideas, you know, it can help us to sort of combat or actually work against this kind of mechanical necessity uh, that's transforming desire in a kind of purely capitalist way. Yeah, actually, in the article, you know, the Hegel and Netflix, I try to uh, find a theoretical foundation of the kind of resistance. All right. So uh, I think actually the Deleuze Gattari's argument also misunderstood, you know, the lots of, you know, actually the point, you know, the because, uh, you know, the, it was uh, the, their argument was actually the, perceived by some sort of uh, liberal, you know, actually, the, you know, perspective. That's why, you know, they actually caused uh, some sort of a problem. We need to actually radicalize the kind of you know point because they also try to uh, you know radicalize you know the uh, psychoanalysis whether they are successful or not. In my opinion, the, that point is so important. What the meaning of radicalization of psychoanalysis? You know, we don't actually the, we don't actually the limit the psychoanalysis to the kind of clinical sense. That's what I'm thinking. We must liberate you know the kind of psychoanalysis to a philosophical thought. And vice versa. Philosophy needs, you know, psychoanalysis. That's what Lacan said, you know. In my opinion, what the, uh, Lacan's you know, ultimate goal was that, you know, the, he tried to liberate, you know, the philosophy or some uh, radicalized philosophy, you know, through a lens of psychoanalysis. So I think whether they are, he's, uh, he was successful or not, that is, uh, I'm always saying, you know, that we need that kind of point. Ooh. What is the radicalization? And so I believe that, you know, I already actually discussed in the article how uh, that kind of resisting uh, subjectivity could be possible. You know, as uh, as I already actually argue and in other you know works and then 
the creation of future is so important in the future time, you know? And we live in the X time, the which was actually you know, coming from, you know, the past. What we believe today as present is definitely the, something coming from present, uh, the past. Is uh, about Benjamin, for instance, he criticized this one habitual perception, habit. He criticized that one, and then uh, many of you, you know the actually French, you know the tradition, you know the the for instance the Meng de Birang and then lots of you know the um, the French, you know the book song as well. You know he they uh, criticize this kind of habit something, and then how can we get out of this kind of habit and then uh, bring in the new actually you know the the mode of a behavior or mode of actually living something like that. So. I think we need to radicalize this idea, and then psychoanalysis will be a tool or some kind of you know weapon to uh, radicalize the philosophical you know thought. And we need a philosophy, but uh, you know most of philosophy actually uh, the consequence of this kind of existing regime. And how can we um, the deconstruct this kind of philosophical thought, so called uh, academic philosophy? I think of psychoanalysis will be you know the the the, you know, the way in which we can, the, you know, the radicalize the kind of philosophical, you know, concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think another thing that's really um, important in your work, and it's something I've always wanted to sort of defend as well, and, and in a way it's interesting that, you know, this conversation, we started by talking about communism and, and the history of that, but then uh, we, we, we're now talking about essentially popular culture. And you mentioned that, you, you know, for you, the culture industry is extremely important and you do tend to, you know, write about, say, Squid Game, for example. So, um, and, and I guess, um, you know, this relates to this concept of the future, right? So what, what is the significance of popular culture? And, and, in, and of course, mm -hmm. it's to, in some ways, it's the psychoanalytic approach, it's reflection of desire, dreams, affects and so on but also it's part of um thinking of the future right and of the relationship between the past and the present and the future in the way that you're describing so do you do you see um popular culture i suppose i would say as a a potential vehicle for this kind of revolutionary energy you know what is the importance of popular culture in other words to put it a really simple way why do you write about popular culture alex rather than just history and psychoanalysis mm -hmm and communism <laughs> <laughs> good question good question yeah so actually i also got to such a question you know from my student and then you know my colleagues in korea um you know actually the, uh if you want to change this world how can we do that you know that is my big question and then now that i'm reaching at the, my own answer you know you can change it doesn't mean actually change. You you can change actually the, your subjectivity. That means that it, well, how can we change our subjectivity? Of course, yes. As I said, we should actually create new subjectivity. You know. Yeah. And once you actually create this new subjectivity, you can invent the past in different way. That is history. Ooh. You know actually the. History does not mean actually the kind of record of the past. It's kind of, you know, the record of the event. Yeah. It's something new comes up. That's, in my, that's why I'm quite, you know, the interest in the, you know, the invention of a new subjectivity. It's a creation of a new subjectivity. The creation means, you know, you know, the, cre the, the original, uh, the, you know, the etymological sense of a cre uh, crisis, uh, the, you know, the creation is from, you know, Krishna. Is that been creation and then destroy as well? You know, you must destroy first and then uh, you can create something. So actually, the creation always uh, actually contained. You know, the sort of meaning of uh, um, the you know deconstruction or some destruction, something like that. So you must uh, destruct what you experience at the moment, and then uh, you would have you know different experience. That is uh, exactly we can say that. Um, the how can you know the the create, invent a new new concept. Yeah. And then uh, from this perspective, actually, I want to quote, you know, Balta Benjamin. You know, actually, Balta Benjamin is a very famous and then uh, important article, um, you know, the work about in the, you know, the age of uh, technical reproducibility. And then in in the, you know, article, uh, Benjamin, you know, qualified, qualified, you know, new condition of uh, artwork in, mm. you know, the age of uh, technical reproducibility. He actually the, the the emphasize that new condition of the artwork is politics mm -hmm. because actually the 
the age of technical reproducibility means you know the age of uh, mass production. You can see that actually Apple, when actually you know the I uh, found uh, you know, you know the Steve Jobs you know put you know that kind of garage band in Mac, hmm. I actually uh, thought okay this is actually the but the, the proof proof of Bart Benjamin's you know the argument yeah. Yeah. is right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Actually, this is a mass production. It doesn't mean actually the factory production. Mass production means that everybody could have that kind of, you know, the 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 way of actually creation. Yeah. Of course, it doesn't mean actually the creation as such, but it means you know technology would give us you know that kind of a possibility to create something. That is actually mass culture in a popular culture in these days. So the in, the culture industry is. Uh, in my opinion, the capitalist machine, which actually try to capture this kind of you know the mass production. So, yeah. uh, so that means actually, cultural pro industry try to remove the political moment from yeah. this mass production. So, popular try culture is of course depoliticized mass production, and the, we need to uh, radicalize that this actually yeah. the, the popular culture from the that point, yeah. the perspective of mass production. No, I mean, I think it's a great point. So essentially, there is a radical potential within mass production itself, but yeah. the culture industry operates to sort of exactly. uh, often that or kind of make sure it doesn't, that potential is kind of like a capturing apparatus. Yeah. You know? yeah, 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 exactly. It's interesting you mentioned, I mean, I want to go back to this really interesting point you just made about subjectivity, because when you were first saying it, about this, uh, we a new subjectivity comes into being and that allows us to, as it were, re, re, rewrite history. Um, I was thinking of Benjamin also and thinking of the other famous quote about history is always history of the victor. Um, but in a sense, um, that's only part of the story because um, when when history is victorious, it's the history, that is also a new form of subjectivity coming into being as victorious, right? So you're sort yeah. of saying that in order for history to be rewritten, you require a shift in what subjectivity is in the present. Would that be right? Exactly. Actually, the the yeah, the, if you get into uh, if you want to get in get into the you know philosophical uh, argument about that, we should uh, bring in a concept of experience. Mm. You know, actually, in Latin, you know, experience uh, means you know experiment as well. Also, it related to exploitation, uh -huh. and this exploitation also connected to production. So, experience and production is kind of a polar, you know. Um, the concept, you know, the, by which we can approach this kind of uh, the capitalist mode of production. That's what I'm saying. So, uh, that means actually the, the communism does not mean actually the cut, you know, this kind of uh, mode of the, the capitalist mode of production, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, the sort of, uh, um, how can I say, the transformation of this kind of mode of production, you know. That is exactly what you know, Karl Marx and uh, Engels, you know, discussed in the German ideology. It's already, mm -hmm. communism is internalized in the actual development of capitalism, something like that. So, um, in my opinion, okay, just uh, the, the invention of subjectivity or new subjectivity does not mean actually we uh, exist as a kind of subject. It's always this subjectivity, new subjectivity, as you know, the following, you know, the Alan Badi, you know, sort of uh, the, the you know, subject of truth. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Kind of be actually vanishing, you know, sooner or later after the, this sort of, you know, actually, you know, crystallization of uh, event happened. So that means, uh, as a, you know, Sartre, you know, the, rightly pointed out, you know, the situation, you know, gonna be fading out when you know state comes in, some sort of that. And then, uh, you know, Freud also, you know, voice about Jorge Berden, you know, that that means Ichi, you know, the, when Ichi comes up, the S must go, something like that, you know, and then. Uh, in my opinion, the, this kind of uh, the subjectivity of a truth or some, uh, you know, or whatever called is, uh, you know, multiplicity, whatever called it, this actually the subjectivity would, you know, preserve all kind of possibility or potentiality or the virtuality, something like that. And then this actual subjectivity always actually the hidden, um, the beneath that kind of, you know, the normal, as you said, a rational representation of this system. Oh. That's what I'm saying. Is that there? Such a, actually the subjectivity does not come from outside. Always, yeah. already actually, you know, the internalized within. 
the system. And then as a critic, as a philosopher, as an analyst, we need to actually find out, you know, what kind of some sort of paradox, you know, always uh, hidden. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the under the, this kind of you know actually the representation you know something like that so representation the, it doesn't mean actually representation uh, could be separated from this sort of unconscious level but unconscious always in you know, a part of this representation and then a uh, sort of actually the uh, monistic origin you know there there is a monistic origin and then uh, that's why actually the you know as you said the victory mm. victory to some point failed as well. So mm -hmm. there is some kind of victorious, you know, discourse. Once that discourse it comes up, that means yeah. already something, you know, failed. You know, yeah. Yeah. internalized within well, that. I mean, in, in a sense, it's a it's a nice, <laughs> although it doesn't maybe sound it, it's a nice place to finish because this is also a kind of hope or optimism, for want of a better word, <laughs> because this can't be stopped, right? I mean, when you were talking about the digital industries, I, I found that really. I mean, so I I really teach digital media at university, mm -hmm. so I teach history of the internet and act on and the history of uh, digital activism and so on so very interested in these topics and what you were saying about the internet just it's it's instinctively very valid and correct i mean what you basically see at the moment is capitalist corporations desperately trying to stop mass production from from yeah. destroying things and creating things anew like desperately trying to regain hold over mm. a situation that is actually quite chaotic mm. and 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 the, mm. the threat of mass production is there um so you really do see that what you're saying this kind of paradox within the system that always does have the potential to kind of erupt mm. uh, and so in a way this is you know this is not a not a hopeless situation right from an anti-capitalist perspective there's a hope here would you say <laughs> <laughs> i think actually the in that sense uh, i want to be a uh, you know hegelian so uh, hegel mm. already had anticipated that kind of association of uh, you know, development or association of, uh, you know, the um, pre-man, some sort of that. Already Karl Marx also actually quoted that one in his, you know, first volume of Capital. The association of pre-man or association of that kind of uh, developed, you know, the civilization, whatever called, you know, would bring in the you know, same kind of communism, some sort of that. That is actually what the Hegel anticipated in those days. So, in my opinion, okay, just... Uh, Universal technology would give us more opportunity, you know. I know there is lots of critic critical critique with this kind of universal actually technology, mm. but in my opinion, actually, the, it would have you know the, you know the kind of ambiguous you know the aspect. What I mean, actually, the good thing and the bad thing you know come together. So uh, what I would call it is both worse is uh, it's okay, but the thing is that uh, both always uh, double you know there. And then uh, double means, you know, the, uh, always actually, it always contained kind of paradox within it. Is a, uh, if you prefer, it might be called, you know, derulium is a Bataille sense, you know, the desire always, you know, to preserve the kind of derulium moment, you know, mm. some sort of then, but I prefer, you know, the concept of paradox and then always over some uh, delusion gutter, you know, the actually define it, a kind of schizophrenic you know, the moment, something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the opposite come together. Yeah. You can see that, you know, every sort of uh, the kind of thing is for you, good for you, that something bad for you, good for the bourgeois, that mm -hmm. kind of thing is uh, bad for the proletariat, something like that, you know, but it mm -hmm. come together. Those are actually the different things or some opposite come together. That is capitalism. You can see that. Mm -hmm. And then you try to, uh, you know, the, Lots of actually policymakers try to bring in kind of, uh, you know, the, the solution to this one, but uh, there is no solution to this one, you know? And as you said, always uh, what is the, the capitalist, you know, purpose? Definitely, they, in my opinion, at the moment, we uh, witness, you know, the, what's happening at the moment. For instance, the Putin, you know, he invaded Ukraine. And why did he do that? You know, definitely. Thing is that he tried to... Uh, retain this system. You know? mm. <laughs> that means actually, you know, the the Biden and then America and the German Germany actually decided, you know, they uh, you know cut up that kind of uh, the the oil, you know, the industry, you know, what I mean actually they uh, announced that. You think about it, you know, the, you would remember that one. The people yeah, yeah. that the Ukraine yeah. war, you know, that they decided to uh, United States didn't, you know, agree with that kind of, you know, the environmental, you know, actually the policy. But uh, 
they uh, finally decided actually that we are gonna transform our industry to uh, you know the environment friendly one. That means actually they will change the energy source, mm. and that stimulated you know the Putin. And then so the Ukraine war does not mean actually kind of you know the the birth of a new uh, regime, but uh, what the Putin tried to uh, retain this you know current regime. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, exactly. That is what you know the capitalism tried yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or capitalism tried to retain this you know current system. I mean, it's an extremely nice interpretation of that situation because, yeah, indeed, it, it does feel like that. The a last attempt to hold on to something which is. Yeah. Exactly. Not sustainable, and and in obviously nobody wants to see a war, but but that does at least mean that you know these things are under threat. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I'm they sorry. resist uh, they resist the transformation. They always talk Ooh. about change, transformation, you know, yeah. novelty. But uh, what they actually resist is a change as such. Yeah, I, I yeah. totally agree. With that. I mean, I mean, I'm surprised we've taken in everything from Squid Game to the Russia-Ukraine war, but but it's been really interesting to to talk about all this stuff. And people should, uh, like I said, read uh, Alex's articles. Uh, there, there should, this should um, a collection of these should be forthcoming fairly soon. A book on capitalism in Asia, which is extremely interesting. Uh, you're also on Twitter, aren't you? Is it Worldless? Yeah, that's your Twitter. So people should follow rest. Alex there and and. Uh, uh, and keep up with his work, um, which is just absolutely fascinating. It's been really good to, to talk to you, Alex. So thanks for doing it today. And uh, yeah, thanks a thank lot. Thank you for your invitation and thank you for watching, everybody. Yeah, thanks for watching, everyone.